Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Neeraj Shah. I'm the director of Maine Center for Disease Control and Prevention. I'm joined this afternoon by Commissioner Jean Lambrew from Maine's Department of Health and Human Services. Commissioner Lambrew and I are delighted to be able to join you today to talk about where we are with COVID-19 across the state of Maine for today, Friday, January 15th, 2021. We begin today's update on yet another sad and somber note. Maine CDC has received the reports of 16 individuals who have died with COVID-19. Two of them were residents of Androscoggin County, five were residents of Aroostook County, two of Cumberland County, two of Hancock County, one resident from Oxford County, two residents from Penobscot County, and two residents from Washington County. 13 of the people who died were women and three were men, one of whom was, between, was someone in their 40s, another was someone in their 50s, two were in their 60s, two were in their 70s, and 10 were in their 80s and older. Their passings bring to the total number of deaths associated with COVID-19 in Maine to now 477. We'd like to take a moment to offer our deepest condolences to the friends, family members, and communities of all of the individuals who have died with COVID-19 since we've begun. Right now across the state, there are a total of 32,781 cases of COVID-19, representing an increase of 823 cases and marking the third day in a row where we have logged more than 800 cases across the state. Of those, 26,923 are confirmed and 5,858 are probable cases. Cumulatively, 1,228 people have been hospitalized. And in the last 30 days alone, 255 people have been hospitalized. To put those numbers in a bit of perspective, of everyone who has been hospitalized with COVID-19 since our very first case, one in five of every person who's been hospitalized has been hospitalized in the past month. Just in the past 30 days, we've logged 20% of all of our hospitalizations. Right now in Maine, 193 people are currently in the hospital. 61 of them are in the intensive care unit and 24 are on a ventilator. Of all of our cases in Maine, 3,337 have been among healthcare workers. I'd like to turn now to where we stand with respect to testing. Right now, our PCR positivity rate on a seven day rolling average now stands at 5.09%, a reduction of almost a full percentage point as to where it was about a week ago. In part, that is a function of the increase in our testing volume, which is now at 686 tests for PCR for every 100,000 people. Antigen positivity rates are now at 7.37% on a seven day basis and antigen testing volume stands steady at 184 such tests for every 100,000 people. Turning now to some outbreaks, I'd like to start by providing an update on an investigation into an outbreak that we opened not long ago, that at Dexter Healthcare, where there are currently 39 cases of COVID-19. We're continuing to work with Dexter Healthcare on all the various fronts that we do with respect to COVID outbreaks, including PPE, testing, infection control, and epidemiology. Just since yesterday, we've also opened two outbreaks that I'd like to comment on. One is an investigation at Clearview Manor in Fairfield, where we are aware of four cases, and another investigation at Halldale Manor in Farmingdale, where we are aware of 18 cases. Turning now to vaccines and vaccinations. As of this morning, 
there have been 70,228 vaccines administered across the state. Of those, 59,611 are first doses and 10,617 are second doses. Before we turn to questions today, I'd like to take a moment to discuss where we stand with, uh, with vaccines and vaccinations in light of some new information that our team received a few hours ago regarding the US government and Operation Warp Speed's allocations of vaccines to states. Before I go into the what's changed, let me take a step back and talk about how vaccines come into the state and how that process has unfolded. Soon after the first vaccines were authorized about a month ago, early in that production process, the United States government and Oper Operation Warp Speed made a decision to hold back in reserve the second doses of vaccines for, for, for folks who had received their first dose of either Pfizer or Moderna vaccine. Earlier this week, Secretary Azar, the Secretary of the United States Department of Health and Human Services, announced that the US government would soon stop holding those second doses in reserve and rather push them out to states so as to help us get more shots into arms. For the second doses that, that folks need, they would start relying on the newly made vaccine coming off the production line, rather than a vial on a shelf that had been set aside. This, this announcement a few days ago uh, to release the second doses was intended to help states turn up the dial on their vaccination efforts. Now, even though Maine had already been in a strong position relative to other states, we were positioned to increase our efforts even more. A few hours ago, we learned that there were no second doses sitting on the shelves. Instead, the second doses that have been coming into Maine and other states for at least a week were already those that were coming off the production line, as opposed to those that were coming off the shelf. Among other things, this means that the anticipated increase in doses that may have started coming into states from clearing out the shelves may not happen. We have just learned about this information and are working to find out more details on what this means and what the implications will be. But among other things, it means that Maine may be continuing with our current supply constraints for the foreseeable future. So let's talk about what this may mean for you. Well, the bottom line is that it does not affect who may be vaccinated, and it may not affect where in the, in the schema you might get vaccinated, but it may affect how quickly you may receive your vaccine. Again, we are working to find out additional information around what this may mean for states, including Maine, specifically around the velocity with which we can vaccinate. Another question that, that may be on your mind is, if I've received my first dose of vaccine, does this mean I might not get my second dose? Well, based on what I was told this morning, second doses will continue to be delivered to states as they are produced. But again, they are not being taken off a shelf. That is the change that we've just learned about. The third question that may be on your mind is, is this going to change the number of doses that Maine can expect to receive each week going forward? And the answer there is that we are trying to get further information about this. We had hoped that the announcement from the USHHS, from Secretary Azar earlier this week, that second doses would start being released from the shelves would in fact increase our allocation. Indeed, but based on what I was told this morning, that may or may not happen. And if it does, it may not happen as quickly as we had hoped. Right now, 
there are more questions than there are, than there are answers. As we learn information from the current administration and the incoming administration, we will keep everyone updated based on what we know and specifically how it affects you and where and when you may be able to get vaccinated. So with that, I'd like to turn things over to our colleagues in the media. The first question for the afternoon goes to Allison Ross. Hi, Dr. Shaw, thanks so much for taking my question this afternoon. So that does kind of impact this first question that I have. Some hospital networks say that they have been talks with the main CDC to expand into the next round of vaccinations, which obviously includes those planning spaces. So right now, is there any idea on where those locations could possibly be for this next phase? Um, Allison, we've been working on finding sites across Maine that, as we've talked about at, at these meetings, tick off a number of boxes. Not least among them is access, geographic equity, the ability to have spacing, high throughput. We've started identifying sites that we think are suitable. Um, I don't know that today's news changes that. We are not putting the brakes on those planning efforts. We are still moving full speed ahead because if and when our vaccine supply increases, we want to be ready to activate those sites as quickly as possible to be able to offer that community level trans uh, that community level vaccination. So we're not putting the brakes on that process. Um, we're concerned by today's news, disappointed, but we're not slowing down what we're doing on our end. Okay, and could you speak to the IT infrastructure work that has been done to accommodate future online scheduling and if the state has received any support, say from the federal government in this? I know this has been a big issue for a lot of states. It has been a big issue. Let me start with what we thought would happen. Earlier on in the process, we, um, we were given information from the US CDC that there would be two specific IT tools that would be rolled out to states. Uh, one goes by the somewhat quizzical name, the IZ Gateway. What that in effect was is a connection process so that all 50 states' vaccine registries could be connected to one another. So we would have insight into who had been vaccinated and if they needed to, if you're a Mainer and you happen to be in Florida for your second dose, all of that could be kept track of. That hasn't materialized. Another platform that we thought uh, and were told would be rolled out would be a nationwide scheduling system, a platform where everyone in the country could go to learn where you could be vaccinated in your community and indeed to register. That too has not materialized. As a result, states across the country are scrambling to put up our own system. We've started investigating some platforms. We had been for many months now recognizing the slowdowns that had occurred at the US CDC and federal level. Um, and we are working to find an IT platform that meets all our needs, not just registration, but pre-registration, not just scheduling, but billing, uh, not just uh, scheduling and billing, but also the consent process, a one-stop shop. As you can imagine, that's been a challenge. It's been a challenge for a number of states. Some states have brought on solutions only to see them crash. We don't want that to happen. So we're trying to find something that's not just usable, but stable and will take us through the next several months. We don't have any announcements on that yet, but please know that we've got a team of folks that are working on it. All right, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna turn now to Patty White at Maine Public. Thanks, Dr. Shaw. Um, with this news from the federal government, has that, that changed our allotment for next week? I think on Wednesday, you said we were expecting 1300 more doses. Is that still what we're expecting? That is correct, Patty. Uh, the, the allotment for next week, week six of the vaccine process has not changed. Uh, we were hoping that in subsequent weeks there would be not stasis, which is what we've seen for the past few weeks, but indeed an increase. We're trying to sort out and get, in, get clear answers, which has been difficult. We're trying to get clear answers from the current administration about what the future allotments might look like. But to your exact question, next week's allocations have not changed. But it, again, it is important to note, Patty, that the allocations we, re we have received last week, this week, and next week are largely flat. Okay, and then just to make sure I'm understanding correctly the flow of um, doses and how they work. So these allotments that we get every week, are they directed towards first doses? So <clears throat> the, the answer, Patty, is yes. Um, up until 
now and, and, and still now, uh, what we receive word of every week are what our new first doses will be. We separately and simultaneously, typically on Sundays, find out what our second dose allocation will be. And those two, as you can imagine, largely track. Three weeks after the first dose, we get an allocation for the second dose of Pfizer. Four weeks or very soon, it will be four weeks with Moderna, we will start getting allocations for those. Those so far have tracked and we anticipate that that will continue. But again, right now, there are more questions than answers. But the numbers that I talk about, 17,000 new doses coming into Maine, those are first doses. Great. There are, are open questions about with the change that Secretary Azar announced, whether the doses that come into Maine in the future will no longer be demarcated as first and second doses, but rather doses for all comers. And then Maine will have to sort out how to, as an accounting matter, make sure that the doses we get are properly allocated for second dose purposes. It, it's, it's quite maddening and confusing. Um, I, I wish it were more straightforward, but let me know if that's clear as mud. <laughs> no, that is helpful. And I guess that would also explain why the US CDC vaccine tracker, it shows that we have more doses than what you typically announce because those are probably accounting for the second doses. You are correct. That is correct. And I have um, my, my colleagues in the in the 50 states and I have, have noted for CDC that on that tracker, there needs to be a demarcation as between which of those 138,000, for example, are first doses versus second doses. The second dose number is incredibly important. I, I've got those numbers. If you want to go through them, we can get them to you separately as well. Okay, no, that's great. Um, if I could just ask one more question. I know this is all very complicated, but to get to that goal that was stated on Wednesday of vaccinating um, through phase 1B by April, how many people do we need to vaccinate you know, per day or per week to get there, however you're sort of figuring that out? Sure. Um, I mean, that, that number is entirely a function of what we get in as supply, Patty. Um, you know, uh, in a world of unlimited supply, it'd be one number, but based on where we are right now for the foreseeable future with what will be a rather constrained supply, that's what's going to drive this. Um, let, me, let, me, let me answer that in a slightly different way, and then I think Commissioner uh, I want, I want to get her take as well. But uh, this upcoming week, the week that starts uh, this Monday, will be in our allocations thus far, the first week where virtually, I think with the exception of one location, maybe two locations, every single site that's getting vaccine could have done more if we had had more vaccine. It, previously, what we've been able to do is match one week throughput with supply. A site says to us, we can do 400 Monday through, through Sunday, and we get them 400. This was one of the first weeks upcoming where sites were saying we can do more, but we simply did not have from the federal government the vaccine to be able to meet that. Okay. And Thank I'll you. add that we are frustrated at the communication that came out just this Tuesday, both in a press release, Secretary Azar's remarks on a call with the vice president was different than what we're learning today. We have been in communication with the incoming team for example, the incoming White House coronavirus coordinator, Jeff Sines, called the governor a couple days ago to talk about the new plan that President-elect Biden released yesterday that is going to begin to provide more visibility and support to states. But going back to the here and now, we do continue our work. So the 18,550 first doses that we'll get next week will go to hospitals, for example, to continue to vaccinate community-based physicians and providers to outpatient groups like the federally qualified clinics and other organizations who are doing the same and beginning to help us as we gear up towards this phase 1B. Public safety will begin to be vaccinated this, this coming week with 2,600 doses going to our emergency medical services to help vaccinate their local law enforcement, state law enforcement, as well as firefighters. And we do continue to work with independent pharmacies and our public health nurses to vaccinate people in assisted living, group homes, and other congregate care settings that are vulnerable to this disease. We are quickly, though, going to turn to what Governor Mills announced on Wednesday, which is those people at most risk of suffering and death. 
older people and eventually people with medical conditions. So hopefully beginning next week, again, supply permitting, we'll be able to start vaccinating main people age 70 and older. Thank you. I'm gonna turn it over to Caitlin Andrews next. Good afternoon. Um, kind of similar to what uh, Commissioner Lambry was just talking about. I know on Wednesday we were hesitant to say, you know, we don't know how many vaccines we're going to get from this expansion. So you didn't want to talk too much about what it could mean. But, um, you know, is it realistic to think that we could expand to this other group this month if the vaccine allocation does not increase, especially since we're still working through 1A? Yeah, Caitlin, I think it is realistic to do so. Uh, I think it's also imperative that we do so, uh, given the heightened risk from death and suffering of COVID-19 that individuals in this group experience. I don't think that piece of it changes. Uh, and indeed, we, we, must con we must start moving down and, and vaccinating those whom we know are at highest risk for morbidity and mortality from COVID-19. We have to start doing that. The velocity with which that we would like to do that may change, and we're trying to get a better sense of that right now. But no, I don't think it affects that piece of, of to whom we move to next. It may affect how quickly we are able to move through them. Okay. Um, and we've, and I know this question has been kind of come up again and again. Um, we've read about the new strains of the virus that are more contagious in other states that seem to be moving closer in New England. Um, do we know the certainty that the strains aren't here yet? And could they have anything to do with um, the increase in cases we've seen in the last few weeks? So, you know, Caitlin, what we can, what we know is what we can test for and look for. And we are sending an increasing number of samples to Jackson Laboratories, as well as the US CDC um, to, for that exact genetic testing to determine whether the, this, this new variant, either the one from the UK or one from South Africa, has been found in Maine. Is it possible that it is here? Yes, that is possible. We are continuing to look for it. We have not found it yet, although it has been detected in at least two cases in Connecticut. So we are on the lookout for it. We're trying to try, we're trying to test for as many of our positive samples as we can to try to see if we have identified it here. We've not done so yet, but given the speed with which this new variant can spread, it is a likelihood high likelihood that we will find it in Maine soon. We're poised for that possibility. Now, could it be accounting for the increase in cases that we're seeing? It's difficult to see, uh, difficult to say, given that we haven't found it here. Um, so it's hard to know. Um, it's also plausible that what we are seeing right now is the aftermath of certain holiday gatherings uh, or the continuing uh, gatherings that are occurring indoors. Very difficult to say, but as of this morning, we had not found any specimens in Maine with that new variant. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to turn now to Dustin at New England Cable News. So, so I know I can't, can't say much, much stuff, stuff, but if you had to pick the demographic, demographic and who was most impacted impact by, by this change in the federal government suddenly, would it be people waiting, waiting for the second, second filter or anything, anything like, like that? that? Hey, Dustin, um, I did not catch uh, what you said. Your The audio was garbled. Um, you want to try again? Yeah, better, better. better. It's not, Dustin. Mind if I come back to you next? That's fine. That's fine. Okay. Uh, we'll come back to you in a minute while I turn to Brian Sullivan. That's terrifying. Uh, was. Can you uh, can you explain the process of how uh, Maine CDC allocates the doses of the vaccine to pharmacies, both chains and independent pharmacies? I apologize if that's you've touched on that in, in the past. And um, is that the end of the CDC's involvement with uh, who gets the vaccine once it actually is in the hand of the pharmacies until you hear back how many they've given out? Got it. So, Brian, um, thank you for that question. It's not something we've touched upon. There are, there are two types of, as your question noted, there are two types of pharmacy providers in Maine. There are the large retail chain pharmacies, Walgreens and CVS, and then there are a number of independent Maine pharmacies with whom we work, both of whom are vaccinating residents and staff of long-term care facilities, nursing homes, assisted living facilities. So they're both vaccinating the same core group of folks, but vaccine gets to them through different mechanisms. Both fundamentally come from the allotment that is given to states. In the case of the retail pharmacies, CVS and Walgreens, we have already committed to that partnership, that program, 
and we indicate every week how many doses will be allocated to them based on a preset formula that was agreed to by all states early on in the process back in December. Roughly 50% the first two weeks, 25% for the subsequent weeks. That vaccine goes directly to the warehouses of those pharmacies. They break it up and they allocate it to their pharmacies to go out on site for. The independent pharmacies, it's a little bit different. We work directly with the independent pharmacies in Maine to talk to them every single week about who they've got on their schedule for long-term care facilities and how many folks that they can go out and vaccinate and do every week. I have to say the, review, the reviews that we've received from the independent Maine-based pharmacies who have gone on site to do these clinics have been nothing short of stellar. I've been so delighted with the partnership that we've had with those independent Maine-based pharmacies. They've risen to this challenge. They've gone on site and the reviews that we've gotten from facility owners and operators have been, they've been rave reviews. Uh, but that's, that's how we go about the allocations for both of those groups. Um, and just trying to process all that you had talked about there with uh, Operation Warp Speed. And I mean, I think maybe for a lot of people, hope was alive that more doses were gonna be coming in uh, pretty soon here. What's the process that actually get, how, how do you get more doses? I mean, how long does it take to make the stuff? And when could we possibly see some change based on what you've just heard today? I know you just heard it a couple of hours ago, but I'm just trying to quantify it for people who might be listening and myself included. You know, uh, Brian, we're, we're trying to quantify it as well. Um, I, I don't, we, we don't have a sense of when the production ramps uh, may increase for the two existing vaccines, uh, such that there will be a higher number of doses available. Uh, that is a, a question that's been on my mind, uh, more so in the last three hours than, than ever before. Uh, we initially, again, had been operating under a planning assumption that there were doses on the shelves that would be released and that those doses would be able to increase our weekly allotment such that we could activate more providers and get them through the throughput that they've told us they could accomplish every week. We now know that that was not accurate. Uh, the other things that could change are, again, the manufacturers could turn up the dials on their end, but one has to assume they're already producing at very high capacity. There's also the possibility that other vaccines could be authorized by the US FDA. There are at least one or two candidates, I've talked about some last week, that are working their way through the pipeline. But even there, based on a briefing that I got uh, yesterday, that still may be several, several weeks, if not longer away. And I guess just real quick, are you hopeful that maybe as of uh, next week, things change and get a little more clear as to how this might go? You know, as Commissioner Lambrew noted, we, are, we have had very productive conversations at all levels with the incoming administration. We hope, to, we hope to get not just better information than we have more recently, but also a better sense of the, project, of the projections that they've got that directly answer the question that you've raised, which is what does the future hold? Um, I'll say this on, on our end, Brian. Right now, for us, it's all gas and no brakes. Vaccine comes into the state, comes out, it goes out the door, all with an aim to get shots into arms that piece of our planning and preparedness is not going to change. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna go back to Mr. Vader. I think that might be better than a uh, robotic lizard humanoid type thing uh, invading everyone's ears. So I apologize for that. Um, the first question I have is, which demographic of people in the state is impacted most by this sudden change by the federal government? I don't mean that I mean that in this way, is it people who are waiting on their second dose of vaccine? Is it uh, someone else? Good, I great, Dustin, thank you. One quick clarification. Oh. We are still, still trying to track this down. This is news in the past couple hours. And I think we want to make sure we've confirmed and reconfirmed both with this administration and the incoming one before we change our plans. It's important for Maine people to know that we are giving you the information as we get it. We appreciate that it's confusing, we're confused, but at this point in time, our plan continues. We are continuing to get vaccine. We're continuing to vaccinate our healthcare workers, our first responders in phase A, 1A. We're beginning to plan for our older Mainers, medically frail people. We will continue our work, but we will try to 
ensure that the information that we receive today is accurate before we change any of our plans. Mm -hmm. and, and Dustin, I'm, I'm glad you raised that, that question. Those who, for example, have received their first dose, um, from what we have, based on what we've been told, their second doses will be available to them. Uh, and, um, and so I don't believe that they're at this time, based on what we've been briefed out on just in the last couple of hours, I don't believe that there will be, well, we don't, we don't know for sure, but we are, we have not been told that second doses will be in jeopardy. And my second commission, uh, question is for Commissioner Lambrew. Has the governor looked at the COVID-19 Bill of Rights proposal from uh, the president of the Maine Senate and the Speaker of the House? Yes, I believe that G Governor Mills did express her uh, shared support for us trying to ensure that people in Maine don't find themselves surprised with a bill when they go to get a COVID vaccine or a COVID test, that they really have the kind of support from the state that they need. We've been working on that already during the pandemic. This legislation would continue that and strengthen that. So she'd sign it? Uh, I can't answer that question. Uh, Governor Mills can do that. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Amy Brown next. Thank you. And I was just sort of rewording one of my questions because I think you've partially answered it about the second doses. If it turns out that you just get one allocation next week that doesn't have some set aside for the second doses, will some of that rather than going to first doses as originally planned be used instead for second doses? Will the state make sure that no one misses a second dose? Amy, at this time, we have no reason to believe that we will not get our second dose allocations. Those have been uploaded. They have been um, they, they have been arriving faithfully every single week in conjunction with the first doses. So at this time, we have no reason to believe that there will not be subsequent second doses. They have been arriving again. They are coming off the production line rather than off the shelf. But there has been no disruption with that, and we have no reason to believe, nor have we been told, that there is any reason to think that second doses will be delayed in any fashion. So I just want to put everyone's mind at ease. If you have received your first dose, based on everything we know, your second dose will be there at 21 or 28 days. So what exactly were you told this morning then and by whom? What we, we, were, what, what we received word of, in my case, it came from the, uh, the Professional Association of State Health Directors a group called ASTO, uh, of which I am an active member. And we received word uh, this morning that the notion that there were second doses physically present on a shelf that could be quickly released, distributed, and allocated to states was not the case. This stands in contrast to representations that had been made earlier in the week where we had been uh, informed that there were, in fact, second doses, and they would be released quickly uh, such that states could start ramping up their vaccination efforts. And what we've learned, what we've been told just in the past few hours and are attempting to confirm so we can understand the implications of, is that those second doses were not on the shelves. Indeed, they had been released at some point, some number of days, weeks ago, I'm trying to get confirmation of that myself. Yep, and just to quote Secretary Azar, he said on Tuesday, because we now have a consistent pace of production, we can now ship all of the doses that had been held in physical reserve with second doses being supplied by doses coming off of manufacturing lines with quality control. And that Secretary, is what we've heard has changed. Mm -hmm. Secretary Azar made it seem as if this was a change that he would be making or had made as of that announcement. It appears that this change was made some time ago. And that is that. News, okay. And uh, I have a question from a listener who noted that you said that even after receiving both doses of the vaccine, people should continue to wear a mask because it's unknown if they can still transmit the virus, even though they won't get sick themselves. And they wanted to know how it's possible to transmit a virus if it's not replicating in your body. The virus can, well, we don't know whether it's still replicating in the body. And that's why the studies underway to determine that are ongoing. 
Those studies involve taking individuals who have been fully vaccinated or partially vaccinated and say, for example, swabbing their nasal passages in the back of their throat to see whether there is any virus there. What the vaccine does is prevents you, we know, from get, getting serious COVID-19 illness. What is not yet fully known is whether the, it, it ramps up the body's immune system such that not only do you not get sick, you don't even harbor the virus. It's possible, we just don't know yet, that you may be protected from illness, which is a great thing. Let's not discount that. But that the body may still harbor the virus such that if you sneeze or cough, it may fly onto another person. It still would be a great thing to, produ to reduce the number of people in the hospital, the number of people who die. But until we know scientifically for sure how, that, how effective the vaccine is at preventing you from even harboring the virus, we've got to take the precautionary route and ask folks to wear masks and physically distance. That's how science works. We can speculate all day long, but until we can prove it, it's just chit chat. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna turn to Patrick Whittle next. Uh, thank you very much and happy Friday. Um, so there's been some uh, concern in recent weeks about, uh, about uh, lawmakers in the state capitol who aren't uh, following the the mask rules especially closely, which I know is, is not necessarily a question for you. But what some of these folks are wearing are these sort of clear mouth guard type devices, which are sometimes called spit shields, and that sort of resemble orthodontics in a way. I'm sure you've seen them at some point. I'm curious if these things are effective at preventing transmission because they seem to be growing in popularity. And I, I, I'm not aware of what the what the science is about the effectiveness of the of these devices at at, at slowing transmission. You know, you know, Patrick, I'm going to be honest with you. I actually have not seen those. I oh, okay. I think I have an idea of of what you may be referring to. I think maybe it's been proposed that by Amazon that I should buy one, which is ironic. But I don't really. I'm not 100% sure. To be totally straight with you. Well. Um... I think I can probably help you out here. I know this is of this is of little use to folks who are who are watching this uh, who are who are watching this at home. But um, it's it's a it's it's essentially um, it's they're used mostly by people who work in 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 the restaurant in the restaurant industry, and um, uh, that's not going to be helpful. <laughs> I'm trying to get this in front of you, and the glare is yeah. so probably not going to work. But there, it's a it's a piece of plastic that that holds a a clear piece of plastic over a person's face, so that they can. That's a little bit better, so that they can uh, sort of avoid getting sort of contaminating particles on on food. Yeah, and I'm I, I'm they, they don't totally cover cover people's noses, but they do have the supposed advantage of people can see your lips moving when you're talking, which is extremely helpful for people who are hard of hearing. So there are pluses and minuses to me and to, to these, and I'm, I'm curious if they're effective enough at preventing the spread of the particles. And if you don't have an immediate answer to this, I, I totally understand that. I, I really don't. Um, I, again, I'll, I'll have to, I'll take a look at those, Patrick. Um, based on the picture that, that you flashed from your phone, um, I, I, I just caught a glimpse that the the, the, you know, the person's nose was not covered. Uh, if, if, if that was, it was at best partial. So that raises some con significant concerns, but I, I'd have to take a look. And I, I don't know if the US CDC has, has made any pronouncements about those or if they've been studied, but I'd, I'd rather not be hasty and speculate having only seen your iPhone photo flashed in front of your computer right. camera. Yeah, that wasn't, wasn't the resolution there wasn't, what uh, wasn't, wasn't terrific, but at any rate, I think it might be helpful for some folks to sort of hear restated what does yeah. constitute a good face covering, and I would love to hear that. Okay, so the, the best kind of face covering is one that is designed to be a face covering. It's one that, whether it's a cloth one that you purchase online or a, a one that's more sort of a standard hospital surgical one, they have a couple of features in common. 
The first is that they form a tight or pretty tight seal against your mouth so that even if you're coughing, there's not air that's going out the sides. It's one that goes below your chin and over your nose completely such that if you're coughing or sneezing, the particles of virus that are carried by droplets don't go too far. You don't need to go and get one of these hospital grade masks. It's, it, studies have shown that the, the masks that are designed as face coverings that are made of cloth, that have multiple layers of fabric that you can't stretch and see through, all of which are really helpful. The best kind of face covering is one that you wear fundamentally. If you're not covering up your nose, you're not doing a good job. If you're wearing it under your chin, it's not doing its job. The best face covering is one that's tight, that covers your mouth and nose, and that you wear. See a lot of folks who carry them around in their pockets or who that who take them off when they're talking to others. Or in one instance recently, someone who took it off while they were coughing. None of that helps. So it's not just important to have a good one, it's important to wear a good one too. Is there a like a sort of a ply density? I've heard some people say three. Is that? No, it's 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 one of those situations where um, there at least two is what has been studied, um, and um, the I, I don't know if it, the marginal benefit from two to three is higher, but at least two. Uh, but it really depends. The, the thing is to make sure the material is not stretchable. It's not like a neck gaiter type of stretchable nylon because as stretched, those become porous and materials can go right through. So it's important to make sure that the material, whether it's one ply that's really thick, two plies that are thin, three plies that are all thinner, I don't know that there's marginal differences among those. It's better to make sure that the material is taut, it's not being stretched such that it becomes porous. Great. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. and, and Patrick, while, while you were just Noting that, I, I was just kind of taking a quick look myself. Um, if I'll, we'll get back in touch with you on those those dental hygiene shields that you noted, um, I, I yeah, we'll get back in touch with you on that. Sure. Yeah, it would be good to know the level of effectiveness that those have because they do have that benefit of people being able to see your lips move. Mm -hmm. It was extraordinarily helpful to people who are deaf and hard of hearing. But they also <laughs> I don't wanna, they don't. They I don't, don't want to discount that benefit one bit. There are similarly types of proper face coverings that are made of clear material that oh. offer that benefit. Um, so I think it's important to note that we can have it all. Uh, we can ensure that those who are hearing impaired can see lips moving and have maximal protection. But the spit shield that you noted, um, I'm gonna take a closer look at them. I don't wanna put my thumb on the scale yet, but my hunch is that they are not up to the task of actually protecting folks. Got it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to turn over to Blair Best at WGME. Hi, Dr. Shaw. So you've touched on this today, but I, I really just want to clarify. Um, some of the state's healthcare systems are anticipating that people ages 70 and older can start signing up to get vaccinated as soon as next week, and some will able to get the shot um, this month. So given what we've learned today, is this still an accurate timeline for these people? The answer is yes. Um, we, we still believe that now is the time to start vaccinating elderly main people, those who are at the highest risk, the most vulnerable, now is, start, is still the time. We hope that we will soon get an additional supply of vaccine. Today's news causes us to investigate further and have doubts about that, but we are not deterred from moving toward those most vulnerable Mainers. Again, vaccine will continue to come into Maine and it will go out the door to healthcare facilities across the state who can get it into people's arms. Just to clarify, you have doubts about getting enough vaccines in order to get these people vaccinated in time? No, our concern is whether the increase that Secretary Azar suggested may be forthcoming will actually be forthcoming. That's the concern we've got. That's what we're going to be investigating further. Okay, and just one last question. Um, it's, it's for our sports director, Dave Ead. Um, what is the specific science that supports no extracurricular activities um, if a county is yellow? If a county is yellow? Yes. Um, Maybe I'll just yeah, begin so. because there's been some, I think, confusion about county colors. As a reminder, uh, 
the Department of Health and Human Services, working with Maine CDC, does these advisories, health advisories, for the purpose of schools. They're advisory because counties are often large with different types of activities going on in different parts of the county. And then our superintendents, school principals, and other school actors, school board members, make decisions about in-person learning or not. The Maine Principals Association adopted a policy for school sports that said if a county is yellow, then there would not be school sports because if you're moving to some sort of hybrid learning, they argue that it probably makes sense not to bring children together to or youth together to play sports. But that was a main principles association guidance. They're the ones who govern school sports. But our health advisories are for the purpose of schools to make decisions on in-person learning. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Blair. I'm going to turn it over to Joe Lawler next. Uh, yes, hi. I, I know you, you've already had a lot of uh, discussion about the second doses and, and uh, Secretary Azar, but I was wondering, and, and I know there's a lot of uncertainty, but I was wondering, are there any hints, any signs that we're going to see, um, you know, increased production by Pfizer and Moderna, you know, in say two to three weeks? and that might help with supply. Have you had any indications of that? I um, I can't really answer that. I'm not a primary source there, Joe. Um, I, I have not had any indication one way or another, but states are not as intimately involved, if at all, in the vaccine production process. So I'm, I don't know the answer, and I, I'm not really a primary source there. That, certainly okay. that's the hope. Um, yeah. and, and certainly, uh, you know, th that's that's what we're all keeping our fingers crossed on. Um, and if so, Maine will be ready to put those doses into arms. Again, all gas, no breaks. But I, I just don't have primary insight into what those production capacities and production ramps look like. Okay, and is that, there that, is something, that is something that we are hoping to get better insight from in our conversations with the incoming administration. Uh, I, I've spoken with a former colleague of mine uh, from Illinois, you know, Commissioner Lambrew has spoken with colleagues. We're trying to learn from the administration what they are seeing from the manufacturers, but at this time, I, I don't have any primary information. Okay, uh, uh, two more questions real quickly. Uh, so the, um, the, the extra money that was just announced uh, from Operation Warp Speed for, uh, I'm sorry, that's not right, but the COVID relief bill uh, 12 million for vaccine distribution and then uh, some other millions of dollars for testing. Are there some examples you can give of how that will how that will help? Sure. Uh, Commissioner, I can let you start or I'm happy to. So oh. there, there are so many ways where we so many. Yeah. <laughs> where yeah. we would benefit from it. We really could use it for helping to find staff for many of these facilities that are going to be vaccinating providing more public education on why vaccines matter, what is our plan, how to get vaccines, how do we figure out the transportation of people who might not be living near a facility that is doing vaccination. So for the vaccination side, I can let Dr. Shaw add more examples. Yep. But I do think I'll, importantly, I'll, well, I'll just say one thing. We're also very excited about the additional support for testing and for contact tracing and social supports because we wish we could vaccinate all Maine people quickly. It will take some time. So we want to, while we are working our way through the people at the highest risk, increase our testing to figure out how we keep everybody safe as we get to every last person in Maine getting a vaccine. I'll add to that list of what we intend or are planning at least to utilize some of those funds for. First of all, we, we are incredibly thankful to our colleagues at the congressional delegation for their efforts to help secure those funds. We've talked about for months how that that the need is there to help states plan and prepare. So we are ready to start working on that and utilizing those funds. I'll add a couple of things. Um, we've talked at these meetings about the incredibly technical IT infrastructure that needs to be in place, the pre-register, register, schedule, plan, consent, get vaccinated, follow up, come back for the second dose. The IT backbone for all of that is immense. 
And that's one area where this funding will be incredibly helpful. Another is around training. We have a lot of folks that are interested in serving as vaccinators, but to get them trained up with the latest knowledge of how to use the Pfizer product, how to mix it, how to take it out of ultra cold, that is all a very intensive training process that too requires funding. We've talked as well about setting up large scale community vaccination sites. Those require funding. Someone's got to make sure that we've got those who can pay the rent for those facilities and such things. So this funding can't, it can't come soon enough. It is important to note, Joe, that it has not yet arrived at the state. We've received information about the funding from the US CDC about what the parameters might be, but the actual funding itself has not yet arrived in the state. And I'll just add that while this funding is welcome, it is not enough. Not we enough. Are, we are hopeful that the legislation that uh, President-elect Biden outlined yesterday has uh, has good prospects in Congress because we just simply don't have enough to be able to do all the work that we would like to be doing at scale with the resources we just received. Okay, and the last topic I wanted to ask is just about how you would characterize the performance of Walgreens and CVS at vaccinating nursing homes. Um, are you getting a lot of data at, about how they're doing, percent of doses use, used, whether uh, staff and residents, the percent refusal of the, or, of the vaccine? Um, and if, it's, if you're not happy with it, does the main CDC have any, any leeway to try to uh, influence them to perform better? I'll start, I'll start with your last uh, note, Joe, and then work backwards. Um, a couple of days ago, I think Monday, I noted that uh, I was disappointed with the slow pace of use of, of 1,950 1, doses of Pfizer vaccine uh, from Walgreens. They were not able to quick give us clear guidance and timelines as to when those vaccines would be used. Uh, it wasn't that they thought it would be a couple weeks. They didn't know how many weeks. So we moved those to a hospital that could use them immediately. We're doing the same thing again this week from Walgreens again, moving it to an independent main pharmacy based in Bangor because that pharmacy is ready to go into nursing homes and long-term care facilities to start vaccinating folks. We're gonna continue doing that. We're not messing around with this. We've, we've got doses waiting to be administered and people waiting to receive them. If we see a mismatch there, we are going to continue moving things around in that fashion. Now, in, in connection with the, the questions you raised, um, we do have some leeway. Again, we've received great reviews and had great partnership with independent pharmacies in Maine. And after consultation and outreach from uh, uh, the, the, the Maine Healthcare Association, what we have started doing is taking sites across Maine who were further down the list or had not even yet been scheduled and assigning those not to CVS or Walgreens, in fact, taking those away from CVS and Walgreens and instead moving them to independent pharmacies in Maine. Again, in an effort to speed up the vaccination, the most vulnerable uh, residents and those staff who are taking care of them in long-term care facilities. Um, we've had concerns over the performance of CVS and Walgreens. Um, they have increased their velocity in the past week we are getting data reports from them once a week. I'd like those reports more, uh, more quickly. Um, we'd also like to see them not just be at stasis, but rather continuing to increase their velocity. Uh, CVS seems to have done so. I, I continue to have concerns about Walgreens. Uh, can you I, say that, uh, I'm sorry, can you just name the how many doses you're, you're shifting to the independent pharmacy and, and which assisted living facility that is that it's going to? Um, it is 975 doses from Walgreens to an independent pharmacy in Bangor. Um, I do not know which facilities they plan to vaccinate. Uh, we could try to get that, but uh, that I'm not aware of. All I know is that there were facilities waiting to be vaccinated, a pharmacy that was willing and able to vaccinate them and doses that were not slated for use. I wanna be clear. This will not slow down anybody. Indeed, it's the opposite. This will speed up the process. And we are also in our next week's uh, allocation going to be directly allocating 2,100 doses to these independent pharmacies and our public health nurses for this purpose. So it's not just 
moving from the Walgreens and CVS uh, allocation to these sites is also, we are also directly sort of supporting them. Mm -hmm. And uh, the final question of the afternoon goes to Bob Evans from New Center. Good afternoon. I don't know if you have heard about the Piscataquis County Commissioner's resolution of protest, but it's being shared with the people in that county. So we are going through it and fact checking it. But one line reads, whereas research and study of the history of pandemics show that face coverings, while not preventing the virus, cause respiratory disease and pneumonia with far worse devastation to the populace than the virus itself. Dr. Shaw, what's your reaction to that? Every single word in the sentence that you just uttered is false. Indeed, if it were true, we would, we would see widespread respiratory viruses and pneumonia in the millions of healthcare workers around the country who wear face coverings every single day, and we don't. Have you heard about this, uh, this coming out of Piscataquis County? Um, I believe I, I saw an email about it, but I have not um, I've not reviewed it in detail, no. Okay. Look, I'll, I'll, I'll just add that throughout the entirety of the pandemic, the governor's decisions have been based on science and evidence informed by public health officials. That is part of the reason why Maine has one of the lowest per capita death rates in the nation. We will continue to use the resources that we have in Maine to support small businesses and help our counties and local businesses get back to normal. Indeed, Maine, Maine continues to rank at the high end of states on the Moody's Analytic and CNN Back to Normal Indians. Understood. Um, and my last question is, uh, yesterday there was an ambulance call to a school in New Gloucester for someone having an adverse reaction to the vaccine. Do you have any info on that? I, um, I, well, uh, Bob, I don't, we don't comment on individual cases or individual patient incidents in that respect, uh, given that you noted the location. Um, I, I don't, I, again, I, I don't have any direct information around that. What we've urged providers to do is if there is any sort of reaction after a vaccine, of course, first and foremost, make sure that the person is receiving proper care and then report that adverse reaction properly to the US CDC which has an entire database to track and investigate those. I don't have any direct information about the situation that you've noted. Uh, I hope that the individual is well. I did not receive anything to suggest that there had been something um, untoward or unfortunate that had happened. Uh, there are uh, reactions that can occur after any type of medical procedure, after any ingestion of a drug. What matters to us is that the person gets prompt, competent care, and that it's reported to the US CDC so we can track these things in real time. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bob. Uh, I wanna wrap up with a couple of things today. Uh, the first is let me take a moment to thank today's interpreter, Maura Nolan. Uh, given some of the audiovisual challenges that we've had today, Maura, thank you for rolling with it. Thank you for helping to keep uh, those across Maine uh, who rely on your services informed about what's going on despite the couple of ups, ups and downs today. Uh, so thank you, Maura. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to do as we go into the weekend, a weekend in which will be followed by a Monday that will mark Martin Luther King Day. I wanted to end with two observations from Dr. King that I think are particularly important for the moment that we are in right now. Dr. King, asked in one of his speeches, a question that we have talked about at these briefings for the past nine months, which is this, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? Perhaps at no other time in our history has the question of what we can do for others and what we owe others been put into as stark contrast as it is today with respect to COVID. Many of the things that public health has urged folks to do are partly for you, but partly for others. Wearing a mask, maintaining physical distance, and now doing things like getting vaccinated. Those things not only have direct benefits to you, but they have wider benefits to your community. 
And I think as we go into this weekend, Dr. King's question, what we can do for others is more important today than it has been. But Dr. King also said something else that was tremendously important. Something that again, the pandemic has brought into stark relief. As we think about the elderly in nursing homes, the young who are out working and the ways in which we are all interconnected by a virus, a virus that can start in one person in one part of Maine, but then be spread wide and far across the state by a chain of interactions that we all share. In recognition of this, though he did not have the pandemic in mind, Dr. King observed in one of his speeches that whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. I keep both of those things in mind as we go through this weekend, as we take a day on Monday to observe his life, and today in particular, Dr. King's actual birthday. I ask everyone to ponder both of those statements, to take some time this weekend to ask what you can do for others, keeping in mind his other statement, that whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. So with that, thank you all for your time this afternoon. As always, please be kind, take care of one another. We will all talk again soon.